Greetings and welcome to lesson three of foundational mathematics. Today we're going to talk about uh, one of the first proofs that we can use to sort of understand how do we apply propositional logic to mathematics and also to incorporate what we talked about in the last class, which was sets um, and the idea of a set. So we need sets in mathematics because we, we want to be able to apply uh, the properties that we can deduce to objects that are members of a set, right? So for example, we, we know um, that two plus three is equal to three plus two. And we want to know, is this true for every number that we can think of? Is A plus B equal to B plus A? Well, that happens to be true. It's, a, it's an axiom. But uh, in some cases, we, we want to look at numbers or some object that could be an element of a set and determine if the property that we are interested in can be true for every element. And if that's the case, we have to be able to discuss it within the context of the language of sets. So today we're gonna to start by discussing De Morgan's law and then, well, one of them, and then we're going to talk about the idea of a collection of sets. Um, and, and, but we might not get to all of this today. Then we'll talk about a collection of sets, which is basically very simple. It is a set whose elements are other sets. We'll talk about power sets, which is a collection of sets. And then we, we may or may not talk about cardinality because actually so far in this course, uh, we don't really have numbers yet. And essentially a cardinality is the number of elements in a set. So we might uh, define this, but in order to account, you have to have <laughs> numbers and we haven't defined any properties of numbers yet. We know they exist in sets, but we haven't defined them. So this is the, uh, the approach I'm, I'm taking here, okay. We'll talk about arbitrary unions and intersections of sets and those implications. And then the last thing is Cartesian products. All of this will prepare us to be able to discuss relations and functions, which we will need to be able to talk about in order to construct the system of numbers that we will be using. So the sets of numbers, like the natural numbers, the integers, and so forth. Okay, so let's start with this. Um, idea of De Morgan's law. Okay, so De Morgan, um, De Morgan's, well, usually the M is much bigger, but I'm just gonna leave it there for now. So De Morgan's law that today we're gonna to be looking at is uh, this formulation. So let's say let A and B be sets. Now I'm not saying anything about the sets, so the empty or not empty. Okay. This just sets. All right. And then what we can say is number one, that the um the union, no, the intersection <laughs> of the complement, the complement of the intersection is equal to the union of the complements. And secondly, if I take, um, what's the other one? I've got it backwards now. Secondly, I can also say that the, the complement of the union is equal to the intersection of the complements. Okay, so sometimes this is called the uh, distributive property for sets or for, for set complement rather, because as you can see, um, what happens to this complement is it sort of gets distributed to each of these sets inside the bracket. And then the operation is uh, changed from union to intersection or from intersection to union. So sometimes it's called a distributive property like this. All right, and the reason I think this is such a great example is because it, it's, it has a couple of features that we can use to understand, learn and teach mathematics. The first one is that we, we have an example of a type of proof that we call as element chasing. 
Element chasing is a type of proof which we call as direct proof. So a direct proof is nothing but when you have some statement which involves some object and its elements or what have you, and you simply, you start with an assumption and then you list, you itemize the implications of those assumptions. And this is often used in something such as axiom checking um, and also in proving set equality or set equivalence, if you like. Okay, and if you recall from the last time, what we need to be able to do in order to prove set equality um, is to show that, well, let me just write down the definition here. So, well, not that definition, hold on, Maybe the other definition. So set equality says that, um, So we say that A is equal to B um, if and only if, so this is a really important statement, this if and only if, which we're gonna come back to, if um, A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. Okay, so this is how we prove set equality. And if you want to prove that two sets are equal, like we do here, we have to show this condition that one of them is a subset of the other and then reverse that. And we have that that is a subset also of the first. Okay, so those are the first ideas about why I'm using this particular law is because we get to see an example of a direct proof. Although you can use other methods, we're gonna use direct proof. Also, we get to see an example of uh, proving set equality and then in particular, this, this theorem can be written in the language of propositional logic quite easily without any confusion. Okay, so here I've got my statement again, and I can easily write this in, in the language of propositional logic. I mean, it looks like this, P and Q, okay, is logically equivalent to not P or not Q. Now, remember, when we talk about propositional logic, what does this logically equivalent means? Uh, well, that's nothing but a biconditional statement. We, we can talk about logical equivalence as being the biconditional statement. Okay, so the biconditional statement is the statement where the conditional statement is true. So we have P or not P and Q implies not P or not Q. But then we also have the converse is true, which says uh, not P or not Q implies uh, not P and Q. Okay, so right away, if we wanted to, we could do a truth table several truth tables maybe, um, and confirm De Morgan's laws. I'm not gonna do that, but it, it could be done you know, in, using the methods we've done previously. But one thing I wanna point out here is that whenever you have to prove a logical equivalence or a biconditional statement, we end up with uh, something like this if and only if which is often abbreviated by IFF. So, so anytime you have set equality, where set equality is the issue to be proven, you will have to prove um, using this biconditional statement. So in other words, we have to prove that the original conditional statement is true. And then we have to prove that the converse is also true. So we have to prove First in one direction is how we usually say it, and then in another direction in order to be able to show that, that this set is a subset of this one, and then go backwards and show that this set is a subset of this one. And this is where we get the idea of element chasing, and we'll come to that here in a moment. But before we actually uh, do the proof, I do want to draw a nice picture 
for you. So let's um, let's take a look at some Venn diagrams. If I can move myself out of the way, I don't know what's my. I've had this mouse. It's very difficult to use. It's weird. Okay, so let's let's draw a couple of Venn diagrams and just kind of get an idea of what we're dealing with. Oh, I didn't want a red one, but that's okay. And we'll compare it to see, you know, basically what does this look like? And um, we can also get an idea of, of what are the possible places where like A, B, and A and B could be, or some element that's in rather uh, A and B could be. So let me change colors before I do this. Okay. So here's going to be A and B. And then also here, actually, I could have just made a copy of that, right? But that's okay. So here I'm going to write down my first, my, my left-hand side, which is the complement of A and B. So sometimes we say not A and B like this. And then over here, I'm going to put the union of the complements. And by the way, I, I didn't mention this yet, but we can use English <laughs> uh, to describe this very simply. So um, we can say that the, the complement of the intersections is the intersection of the complements. And by the way, I'm only gonna be proving uh, one of these because, um, I mean, one of the two statements I wrote down originally because the proofs are both the same in, 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 uh, for, for either case. Okay, so first we need to determine what does it mean for some element of this set complement of A and B? So what, what does that mean? Where could, let's say I have an X. Okay, so let, we need an X. So suppose X is in this set here, X is in this set. So what does that mean? Well, this set tells me where X is not. And so wherever X is not, it could be anywhere else. So it means that X cannot be in this intersection in the middle, but X can be here, X can be here, and X could be anywhere else in here, okay? So the only place that X is not is here in the center in this intersection. Okay, so that's what being in this first set means. Now let's take a look at what happens if X is in the union of not A or B. So if X is in the union of not A or B, so it means that, okay, so where is not A? Well, not A is everything that's out here, of course. It's also not B. And then not A is going to be here in the part of B that is not intersected with A. And by the way, let me label these because I didn't, did not do that. So there we go. There's A and there's B. Okay, so that's not A, but we have a, a union. We have not A or not B. Now, because it's the or, being in not A is fine or being in not B is fine. So it doesn't matter that not B is a part of A, okay? Because we have the or. So that means that if X is in the complement of B, not B, then X is all these places outside of here, but also in this location. But we know that X can't be here in this place because this is, this is part of B, right? So in this location, X can't be in here because it's part of A and X can't be in here because it's part of B. So X can't be in A or X can't be in B. So in other words, this is exactly the same as the uh, left side one, okay? So where are the possibilities for X to be? Well, you can see X could be in A, X could be not in A or B, and X could be out here. And that's the same thing here. So X could be in any of those locations except for uh, it cannot be in the intersection. Okay, so visually, hopefully that kind of makes sense, right? Um, now let's go about to prove it logically. And the reason we want to do this is to kind of get an idea of how we can take some general 
logical propositions and apply them to more uh, specific mathematics. Okay, so here's our theorem. And also I want to introduce you to number one, in fact, we're using a direct proof. Number two, we're doing something called element chasing, which is very useful. And we're proving a biconditional statement, which requires uh, an extra step that some proofs don't require. And we're using an example <laughs> that involves proving set equality, which is which often comes up. Okay, so our theorem is this. Um, we're going to say let A and B be sets. Then the first theorem I'm going to prove, actually the only theorem I'm going to prove in this video is A intersected with B complement is equal to the inter the you yeah the sorry the union of the complements. Okay, so the complement of the intersections is equal to the union of the complements. Yeah. Okay, so here's our proof. Now we always start our proof with you know, the assumptions that we've been given. So we're gonna say let A and B be sets. Okay, so let's give it to us. And then we'll say, let X be in this set. Now, whenever you prove a biconditional statement, if and only if, all right, you usually want to specify to the reader which direction you're proving first. So, I'm just gonna draw a little arrow here in brackets to indicate that I'm proving in the right side direction. So in other words, the first thing I'm going to do is prove that if I start with this set, I will end up with this set. So in other words, I have to prove that, that this set is a subset of the one on the right-hand side. The set on the left-hand side is a subset on the, of the set on the right-hand side. And how do I do that? By looking at what it means for some element X to be in this set, okay? So we said, let X be in the complement of the intersection. So then this means that X is not in the intersection of A and B, okay? And so this is what I was talking about now. We just sort of go through and itemize what does it mean to be in this set? This is the idea of a direct proof, okay? So if X is not in the intersection of A and B, it means that X is not in A or X is not um, in B. And so now that we have this statement or this or statement, so we have two possibilities that we have to pursue, okay? So we have to look at what happens in each case in order to be able to prove this. So the first thing we want to do is say, okay, um, let's pick one of these, okay? And then we'll, we'll wrap it up and, and look at what happens in the second case. So suppose, um, suppose X is not in the set A. So if X is not in A, okay, um, then, That means that X is in the complement of A. Okay, that's very simple, right? X is not an A, so X has to be in the complement of A. Now, here's one of the, I don't know why this was always uh, so interesting to me or so remarkable, but as long as, maybe it's just because the proof is very simple, not sure. Uh, but once we have X is in this set, right, A complement, it doesn't matter what other set we union with, X will always be in this union, okay? So once you have this, once you have established that X is in some set and you're trying to prove that it's in some union, well, we know that anytime X is in the set, if you union that set with any other set, X will still be there, okay? So, so since X is in the complement of A, this means, that X is in the complement of A union with any other set, including the complement of B. So right now we have a, the first statement, right? We have that if we start with X um, in this set, and if X is not in A, right? 
then X is in this uh, set over here. So we have that in this case, um, our, the complement of our intersection is in fact a subset of the union of the complements. But we're not finished because we also have to show that this is true if X is not in B. Since we have this or right here, we don't know which one it is, okay? So X is not in A or X is not in B. So we've shown now what, has hap what, what happens if X is not in A. Now, let's say um, if X is not in B, well, then we'd basically say the same thing. If X is not a B, then, um, oops, then that means that X is in the complement of B. And that means that, again, we're gonna be in this uh, union and I'm just gonna write it in this way, just because, because <laughs> I want to. Okay, so we've, we've exhausted the possibilities here. And so we can conclude uh, this, we can say that um, for all X um, that are in, my first set, the complement of the intersection, uh, we have X is in the intersection of the complements. Okay, so what that means, therefore, A intersected with B complement is a subset of, oops, why am I writing X again? It's a subset of our, of the intersection of our complements. Okay, so that takes care of the right-hand side. Now we've got to go in the other direction. So typically what we'll do is we'll just write a little arrow and then put it in some brackets, okay? So now let's see what happens if we start with X and the other set. So we'll say let, X be an element of this set, the intersection of the complements. And so now again, we just want to itemize all of the possibilities. So if X is in the intersection of, um, did I write this upside down or what? Hold on a second. Oh yeah, what just happened here? <laughs> oh, it's here. Yeah, I've been writing, I don't know what happened to me. So this is not, it's, sometimes it's hard to think and write at the same time. Okay, let me, let me just fix this. Hopefully you were yelling at the screen like, hey, that's wrong. Okay, so then I wonder if I have to go back and... Uh, right, okay, no, no, we're good. So, so like I said, um, this part's finished. We proved that this side is a subset of the complement of the unions, not the intersections, which I've said on accident or something. Okay. So now we start, yeah, it's gonna make this proof a little bit strange if I did it. This is, <laughs> this, and it doesn't make sense. Okay, so now we're gonna say, suppose X is in the union of uh, the complement of A or B. So what does that mean? Then X is um, in the complement of A. What is going on with my, it's like doing some weird stuff here. Or, oh, it's better now. X is in uh, the complement of B. All right. So what, what does that actually mean? Well, if X is in both of these, then, So it means that X is not in A. Okay, so X is in A complement, right? Or X is in B complement. So X is not in A or X is not in B. Okay. So if X is not in A or X is not in B, 
it would be impossible for x to be in their intersection. Okay, so uh, so x could not be in the intersection because in order for it to be in the intersection, it must be in A and B, right? But it's not in A and that's enough for it not to be in the intersection of A and B. Now, I don't want to talk about if it's empty right now. So, so we'll leave that for another time. Um, when we talk more about the empty set and so forth. Um, but if X is not in A or if X is not in B, then it's, it's immediately, well, if it's not in X, um, if it's not in X, if X is not in A, and so I'm just kind of putting a lot of thoughts into one little line here. If X is not in A, it cannot be in the intersection of A and B. Or if X is not a B, it also wouldn't be able to be in the intersection. So in either case, it won't be in this intersection of A and B. And what is that? What is that set? Well, if X is not in the intersection of A and B, the conclusion is that X is in the complement of A and B. And that's exactly what we were trying to show. Okay, so what did we show? We showed that if we start with our X in this set, we can prove directly that that means it's actually in this set. And so therefore, um, for all X in the union of the complements, we have X in the complement of the intersections, which means that this set is in fact a subset of this one. Oh, hold on, I put the, wait a moment. Okay, like this. Okay, so then from here, we go back up to what we said before. Okay, so now we've got two statements. The left side, the subset of the right side, and the right side is a subset of the left side. So therefore, this is nothing but set equality. Okay, so we'll say like this. Oops. Since uh, this one is a subset of this one, and this one is a subset of this one. Um, we have that they must be equal to each other by the definition of set equality. And so therefore our proof is concluded. Okay, so really, Excellent example for people just learning to do um, mathematical proofs and so forth and, and to go from propositional logic to more specific uh, mathematics. And yet it's still general enough that we can apply this um, to just any set of objects, okay? Because when we're talking about sets of objects, we're not, we're not saying what are the elements in these sets? You might notice that. We're talking about any sets, right? Um, we haven't specified elements. We haven't specified, are we talking about numbers? Are we talking about letters? Are we talking about um, data, groups of people? Are we talking about um, mathematical objects? So, we, you know, this is very still very general. Okay, so I think, um, I can't see how long I've been doing this, but let me just go through and I will define a couple more things and then I'll probably wrap it up because I don't want this video to be too long. So I'll probably go to right here. So I just wanted to, to discuss a collection of sets and um, the idea of power sets. So let me just grab my notes again. Because I closed them. So while that's doing, so oops.
I'm going to write this in a different color. So here's a definition. Um, a collection of sets. Okay, so just a moment while I, you know, I never memorize anything uh, really on purpose unless I have to take a test or something. So um, some things I've done it so many times, it's just um, in my memory, but there's still like, it's easy to leave off some things and I'd rather not be forced to memorize everything or um, anyways, yeah. Usually I, I store things in memory for the projects I'm currently working on. So a collection of sets is um, a set whose elements are sets. Okay, so um, yeah, pretty simple, right? So what's an example of this? Um, so suppose I say, let um, A be, well, let me, let me do it like this. Um, I'm going to call it, um, let AI be the set of the results of rolling um, a die um, six times, so it's going to be a little strange, for six experiments. I'll call them experiments. Well, let me call them a trial. Sorry, something specific here. Uh, six times for six trials. Okay, so let me explain what I mean by that. So like A1 would be I rolled the dice six times and I got like one, three, four, four, and then one, two, three, I'd make a few more, and then a one again. Okay, so this would be like an example. And then I would have it up to A6. And then maybe A6 would be, you know, whatever, who knows. Okay, so this would be my set. Um, AI, which I could just easily just call it A, right? Let me, yeah, let me just call it A. A. Okay, and then A would just contain all of these sets. So A would be the set that contains these six sets with where each set has six elements. <laughs> okay. So this would be um, my set A. Okay, so that would be considered a collection of sets. All right, so another um, one more idea here before I actually move on is um, we need to be able to distinguish between uh, three ideas. So I'm going to write down three things here. Oh, before but before I do that, let me just say that um, many times in a textbook, you might see collection of sets uh, written in a script script uh, letter. So instead of like, uh, oops, instead of the letter A, like I've written it, you might see it uh, like a fancy A. <laughs> I can't do it right. Or like a B like this. So this would be like a script B and this would be your typical B like that, okay? So you might see it like that, written like that. The script A would be more like this. Yeah, something like that, okay. So let me write down three things and make sure that we understand what each of them means before we go forward. And then I'll have this one. And that's gonna introduce us to the definition that's coming next. So in each case, I have a set A, and in each case, I have something that is belonging to A in some sense. So here, this A is an element in the set A. Okay, in every case, we're going to be in the set A. But this, this A is an element in the set A. Um, 
This means that there is a set that contains only A, okay? So anytime you have a set that has only one element, we call it a singleton set, it has just one element. And so what this is saying is that this set that contains only A is a subset of the set A. And then here, I've got another idea. And this is where the set is an element of the set. So here, this set is a subset of A. But in this case, I have a set, a singleton set A that is an element of this set P of A, which is uh, called the power set, which is what we're gonna talk about next. Okay, so you can have a set that's a subset. You can have a set that's an element. In this case, this is the collection of subsets, the collection of all possible subsets of A. Okay, so let, let me write down that definition. So we say the collection of all possible subsets of a set, we'll say, call it A, uh, say A is called the power set of A. And we write like this, uh, usually it's like a fancy P of A. Okay, so this is called the power set of A. Now, let me give you an example. So suppose um, A is equal to the set containing X, Y, and Z. Okay, so then the power set of A is going to be all the possible ways that we can create and combine subsets of A. So it's a collection of sets. Okay, so P of A is going to be equal to the set that, well, before I said that every set, did I say this before? Maybe every set is a subset of itself. So that's our first uh, set we can include. So the set is a subset of itself. The next thing we can include is the empty set. Okay, so the set actually, the set containing the empty set is not the same thing as the empty set. So let me get rid of that and just write the empty set. But actually, wait a minute. Just a moment, let me check my, uh, my notes again. Because I just forgot, should I say <laughs> the empty set or the set containing the empty set? Okay, yeah, so we're just talking about the empty set. And actually, if I wanted to be, I could write the empty set like this, or I could just use uh, this, either way is fine. Okay, so. I think I'll use uh, this one. So the empty set is the set that has no elements. Okay. All right. So then we have to look at all the other possibilities. Well, we have, if we, we have three singleton sets, I'll just start there. And then we have various combinations of two sets. So we have X and Y, and then we also have Y and X. And then we have, um, z and x and then lastly we have z and y okay now let's see if we're finished one two three four five six seven wait a minute that's too many uh one two three four five six seven eight i should have eight sets right and do i let's just count one two three four five six Oh, I've done one of them twice, haven't I? Yeah. <laughs> so the order doesn't matter here. If I have X, Y, or Y, X. Ah, okay. So I've got X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, and Z, Y. Okay, so now that means I've got eight. Okay, so how do I know that I should have eight elements? It turns out that the cardinality and I'm just gonna mention this uh, briefly and then wrap it up. Cardinality of the power set of any set A is equal to two, and put this here. 
cardinality of P of A, uh, let me add some additional information here, given by is equal to two to the power of A. Okay, so now you're like, what's the cardinality? Well, from this context, you could probably see that it means the cardinality is the number of elements in a set, which is correct. So let me write this definition down. So definition, um, let A be a set. Um, the cardinality, cardinality of A is the number of elements in a set. And it's written um, like this. Wait, right, it's a lowercase a, so I can say. Um, so we can write it like what looks like absolute value signs um, in whatever that is. Or we can write card of a, which I'm kind of partial to writing it like that. Which is in. Now this is, um, I know this makes it look like every set should have a cardinality and every set does have a cardinality, but that doesn't mean that we know how many elements are in that set. So I know it sounds weird, but some sets have elements that are not possible to be counted. Okay, so we have some sets that we could easily count and then we have um, other sets that are not countable. Okay, yeah, that's what I meant to say. So here, what did I say two to the power of A? I'm not really sure now. Hold on a second. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I meant to write, so I didn't write this down correctly. Um, this should be like this, two to the power of the cardinality of A. Okay, so yeah. So back to the power set, let me just kind of fix that up. So the power set of A has cardinality, and I could write the card of script P of A. God, that's not a very good script P. Cardinality of script P of A is equal to two to the power of the cardinality of A. Okay, so I guess this is probably where the other notation is more useful, this one, because it'd be easier to write that like this. But either notation's fine. One thing is that we can't really agree on notation as mathematicians or scientists, it seems. All right, so yeah. Now we can prove this um, once we have, uh, we'll prove this once we have some natural numbers after we construct the natural numbers. Okay, so I think that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about today, except for, yeah, that's actually it. So the next time I'll begin, we'll talk about arbitrary unions and intersections. And then we'll talk about Cartesian products. And from Cartesian products, we'll go ahead and talk about relations, uh, functions. And then there's some subtypes of functions we'll talk about, uh, subtypes. And then we'll talk about some special types of relations called equivalence relations. And all of this is leading up to us being able to construct the natural numbers, and then from there, examine properties and um, algebraic structures and, and some number theory using uh, integer, not integers, but natural numbers. Okay, I years. And then once we finish that, We'll next move on to the integers and then uh, to the rational numbers, to the 
irrational numbers then to the real numbers and so on and so forth until we have all the numbers. And then we'll start to talk about, well, this is my um, ideas for the course. We'll start to talk about um, some more geometry, some more number theory and other things that you might see in like a competitive math and um, theoretical math courses. Okay, so that's it for today. I hope that was helpful. If you have questions or if you notice any mistakes, please uh, let me know.